Now let's summarize what we have covered so far. We said that in any unit operation, the four basic process variables are pressure, flow, temperature, and level. In instrumentation, the measuring device is called a sensing device, or a primary element. We discussed pressure sensing devices, pointing out that the simplest pressure sensing device is the flexible diaphragm, and that the bellows, which is also a pressure sensing device, operates on the principle that any difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the bellows will result in compression or expansion of the bellows. This movement is translated by linkage to a pointer, which moves up or down a scale to indicate a change in pressure. We said that another important device for measuring pressure is the differential pressure, or DP cell. The DP cell not only measures a difference in pressure, or delta P, but also can transmit this pressure to another location. The use of the Borden tube as a pressure sensing device was also discussed. We talked about orifice plates, what they looked like, and how they were installed. We said that pressure energy and velocity energy were interchangeable. And we discussed how this principle applied to the Venturi and to an orifice plate installation. We discussed pressure drop across an orifice and that rate of flow was proportional to the square root of the pressure drop, or delta P. We talked about meter constants and said that the flow rate for a particular orifice and meter installation could be determined by multiplying the meter constant by the square root of the delta P and how the square root chart eliminated the need to extract the square root, so flow rate could be calculated by multiplying the meter constant, F, by the pen reading, L. We said that the rotometer operated on the principle of maintaining constant pressure drop across the float by varying the annular open area between the float and the tube wall. We talked about the sliding vane meter, the use of positive displacement meters, and the lobe meter. We talked about temperature sensing devices, about the thermocouple and the principles of operation. We discussed hot and cold junctions, some of the wire metals used in thermocouple installations, we talked about thermostats and the principle upon which they operated. The fact that different metals had different rates of expansion was covered, and how the bimetallic thermometer operates. We discussed the bulb thermometer and how it operated on the expansion of a liquid instead of a metal. And we looked at some of the level sensing devices the simplest of which is the gauge glass. We talked about the use of a displacer for measuring level, and how the changing weight of the displacer applied a changing twist or torque to the torque tube. We covered the ball float, and the use of differential pressure instruments to measure level the use of the very simple bob gauge was covered, along with the more complex varic instrument, which can both measure and transmit level information. Now open your workbook to exercise number six. This is a review of segment one. Segment two deals with the control loop and how automatic control is accomplished. 
We have talked about the various devices for sensing pressure, flow, temperature, and level. Now let's look at how these process variables are controlled. The control is accomplished through what is called a control loop. You have seen a flow control loop described on flow plan sketches like this. These symbols are a simplified way of designating an automatic control loop, in this case a flow control loop. But when we add more of the hardware contained in the automatic flow control loop, it may look like this. The delta P measured by the orifice plate goes to a transmitter, which converts the measured delta P to a signal, which is proportional to the delta P. This signal goes to the controller. The controller compares this measurement to the desired measurement, called set point, then computes a control signal, which goes to the control valve. The control valve will then open or close as necessary to keep the flow rate at the desired point. Similar automatic control loop configurations could be drawn for the simplified control schemes for temperature, pressure, and level. But let's combine them all into a generalized block diagram. Here are the essential parts of an automatic control loop. The primary element, which measures the process variable, transmitter, if required, the controller, the final control element, which is usually a control valve, and the process being controlled. This general diagram can then be used to describe any automatic control loop. The process is the system which is being controlled. It could be a flowing stream in a pipeline, a tank, a reactor, a tray in a tower, or any process system. The primary element is the sensing device which is used to determine the measurement of the process variable that is to be controlled, flow, pressure, temperature, or level. The controller is the mechanism which compares the measurement of the process variable to the desired value of the process variable, called the set point, and computes a control signal to the final element that will cause the process variable to be the same as the set point. The final element, usually a control valve, is the device which takes the control signal from the controller and performs whatever action the signal demands. A control valve will open or close as required to hold the process at the set point. The operation of a control loop may seem difficult until you understand what is taking place. Suppose we take the familiar shower water control system as a simple example of a control loop. In this control loop, the process is the shower water. So we replace the word shower with process. The primary element is the left hand, which is sensing the temperature of the water. We replace the left hand with primary element. The controller is the brain. It takes the nerve signal from the left hand, compares this value with the set point, which is the desired temperature, and then sends a nerve signal to the right hand to take the necessary action to obtain the desired set point, or water temperature. The final element is the right hand shower valve, with the measurement and control signals being the nerves. We replace the right hand with final element. Now suppose we wanted to automate this shower system. We replace the left hand with a thermocouple, which will sense the shower water temperature. The thermocouple transmits this temperature to a controller, which has replaced the brain. The controller compares this actual temperature with the set point temperature, and then sends a signal to a control valve, which has replaced the right hand shower valve. The control valve then opens or closes to bring the water temperature to the set point or desired temperature. Now you have an automatic control loop that has all the essential elements, the process, 
primary element, controller, and final element. Let's look again at a flow control loop. The process or system being controlled is the flowing stream. The process variable is flow rate. The orifice plate is the primary element. It measures delta P, which can be used to calculate flow rate, the process variable. The transmitter, frequently a differential pressure cell, converts the measured delta P into a signal, which is proportional to the delta P, and transmits it to the controller. The controller compares the transmitted signal with the set point and then signals the control valve to open or close as necessary to hold the flow at the set point. The control valve, or final element, receives the signal from the controller and takes whatever action that the controller indicates is necessary. All of the control loops that we have examined are closed loops that provide continuous automatic control. If we remove any part of the closed control loop, it then becomes an open loop. This is an example of an open loop. A person has replaced the automatic controller. This operator reads the indicated flow on a meter, and then he manually adjusts a hand control valve as needed to obtain the desired flow rate. Now let's examine the parts used in control loops. In segment one, we looked at the primary elements, or sensing devices, for process variables of pressure, flow, temperature, and level. The parts of a control loop must communicate with each other by sending signals that can be interpreted. Much of the hardware in control loops is interchangeable and can be selected for use in different types of control loops. For these reasons, a uniform set of signals are used between transmitters, recorders, remote control set points, indicators, controllers, and control valves. The set of signals used depends on whether the instruments are pneumatic or electronic. Pneumatic instruments operate or communicate with an air signal that varies from 3 to 15 PSIG. Most electronic instruments use a 4 to 20 milliamp signal but some manufacturers use a 10 to 50 milliamp range. When pneumatic and electronic instruments are mixed in the same control loop, a transducer is used to convert signals from air to electronic and vice versa. This recorder chart is an example of how an air signal from a pressure transmitter positions the process pen. A three PSIG signal causes the process pen to read zero. Nine PSIG moves the process pen to mid-scale, and 15 PSIG would move the process pen to the maximum process pressure reading. Notice that the air signal is three PSIG when the process pressure is zero. This air signal of three PSIG is called a live zero. Similarly, the live zero for electronic instruments is 4 milliamps or 10 milliamps, depending upon the range of signal being used. Why is a live zero used? To prevent a signal failure, which would read zero, from being confused with a minimum process variable reading. Now turn to exercise number seven in your workbook.